Good afternoon or morning, as the case may be. It's uh, June 18th, and it's a pleasure to have three young, incredibly energetic and productive economists with me this morning or afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Hammerman, talking to you from Austin, Texas. We have with us today Ludovic Picasso, who's at University of Warwick, Steffi Roth, who's at LSE London, and then finally Jonathan Comer, who is at the University of Virginia. Charlottesville, one of the most beautiful places in the United States, by the way. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning, and we're talking with them about issues of environment, pollution, and the effects on individuals and labor markets. Let me start off then, since we're talking about these effects, asking where they come from. What's the biological basis of it? Why, if I breathe in all this stuff, is my mind going downhill? Let me first start off, since Jonathan's on the screen with him, and then move across with the other ones. Jonathan, what's the answer on that one? Well, Dan, our understanding of the biological pathways through which pollution affects cognitive performance and health sort of depend on the pollutant. But in general, it's thought to arise through uh, vascular and inflammatory mechanisms. So, uh, for example, particulate matter uh, are oxidants that can reach the vein directly and then sort of affect the nervous system, uh, but also can also uh, affect direct health through reduced cardiovascular and respiratory function. Okay. Ludovica, is that pretty much correct? Or is there anything? What Jonathan alluded to specific differences of individual pollutants. Can you give me an example of that? Ludovica, let me ask you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I feel like m we, we know very little about each specific pollutant, but for example, the pollutant I have been studying the most, uh, which is lead, um, also can affect the brain directly. Um, it can actually damage uh, nerve cells, uh, potentially irreparably. Uh, and, and, it, um, and therefore, um, as it mimics calcium, the, the body is uh, tricked to thinking that it, that it is calcium. And so it binds with it and um, it ends up and therefore it let ends up clogging uh, all our um, systems and functions, including cardiovascular, um, just as other pollutants. Let me ask Sefi. I mean, from what it sounds like, it sounds like the thing that all old people like me worry about, namely Alzheimer's. Is the, bio, is the biology of this like Alzheimer's in the brain or is it something different? From that? I'm ignorant. I'm just asking. No, no, no. That, that, that's a very good question. So recently we've seen a uh, kind of increase in, in the literature about the link between air pollution and Alzheimer's and, and dementia. So, uh, yes, yeah, so th there is there is kind of uh, a link between uh, the two. And this is kind of going back to what Jonathan were, were talking uh, about when when he was talking about the biological perforates is coming through the, the kind of the inflammatory mechanism uh, in the body is mainly in, in, in the nervous system. But I also want to add, if you don't mind, just one more thing to what my colleague said, <clears throat> because they were talking about the direct, what I call the direct biological pathways, uh, which are absolutely correct, how air pollution affects the brain directly. But there is also kind of a more indirect health effect. And, and what I have in mind is that we know that air pollution can cause some kind of mild health impact. So, for example, when we're exposed to air pollution, we have headaches fatigues, uh, some irritation of the nose and, and the throat and all these kind of things together or in isolation can uh, lead us to kind of reduce cognitive abilities. So think about taking an exam, for example, when you have a headache, you're probably not going to perform as well compared to where you're taking an exam in an optimal condition. So this is another kind of indirect health impact that can uh, explain some of the results that we see in the literature. Okay. So we are all exposed to pollutants all of our lives and even before in utero. So given a certain amount of some pollutant, pick your favorite pollutant, I don't care what it is. At what age, from minus nine months to 90, is a given exposure worse for one? Ludovica, any thoughts on that or don't we know enough to say anything? Am I being too general? I think it's a great question, and I, we are refining our understanding more and more. Uh, let me answer in kind of a bit of an economist way, saying it depends, right? I think it depends on <laughs> what uh, what your what what is the outcome that you're interested in. I think from a um, human capital 
development, uh, you know, we, we, we used to think, again, the, the example I'm going to use is lead because that's what I know best. But we used to think that exposure very early on, the first two years of life was really when it mattered the most. Uh, but nowadays, we're starting to understand that even later, uh, later on, uh, exposure is really important for, you know, those cognitive and non-cognitive function, for all functions for the brain developing. And the reason that we used to think that early childhood was so important is, uh, you know, because the, you know, uh, the brain is developing right at the time the most. And so that's when, you know, every uh, little disturbance can have a long lasting impact. It also, you know, uh, there is a there is a size um, kind of component to it, whereby the same amount of lead if I ingest it, uh, you know, it, compared to my body mass is very different um, from if a toddler ingests it, right? Um, but again, now uh, just recently, uh, a new paper was published showing that uh, even adults, even elderly folks really can suffer from exposure to airborne lead. And in fact, um, you know, we know that, for example, from a mortality perspective, uh, you know, probably exposure later in later life uh, is really important, right? That's when uh, folks uh, start to become sort of frailer, potentially and more subject to those cardiovascular issues that, uh, that pollution um, is linked to. That makes a lot of sense. Let me skip to another question then. Uh, you know, I don't know how much pollution is going on. In my mind, since I was a little kid, the world seems much less polluted, at least my American world, than when I, for example, lived in New York in the 1950s. Everything seems cleaner. And yet we're having unquestionably a global warming, despite Mr. Trump, may he rest in peace quietly in Florida. Despite that, global warming is proceeding more and more severely. And does that have similar effects? Directly or indirectly, Jonathan, any thoughts on You know, uh, it's first important to understand the differences between air pollution and global warming, uh, which are two different but related uh, environmental issues. So when we talk about air pollution and its impact on a on, on variety of different outcomes, we, we talk about pollutants like PM2.5 and, and, and NOx and things like that, which are more local in nature. So I emit NOx, for example, by driving a car or something like that in London. That affects the residents in London. Uh, but doesn't really affect residents of, let's say, people in Beijing in China. When we talk about global warming, which is <laughs> attributed to uh, increasing global CO2 concentration, and the key word here is global, we talk about uh, a global phenomenon, right? So my emission of CO2 in London will contribute to global CO2 concentration and therefore to global warming everywhere. Okay, so these are two different things. Um, so, you know... Uh, it's, it's a bit hard to kind of uh, mix these two things together. But going back to uh, to your original question, if we see kind of improvement in air quality over the years, that very, very much depends on where you are and which periods do you compare. So if you look at, for example, the US and the UK, if you compare the 1950s to where we are now, we are in a much better position. Okay, and even if you look at London over the last, I would say, three to four years, we improved the air quality here dramatically. And this is down to, to policy. So in the US, you had the Clean Air Act that, that happened here in London recently. We, uh, we, we introduced some, uh, uh, some uh, really good uh, policies around, um, around transportation, and these policies work. Uh, so I think that uh, in most places we see reduction. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, uh, many in developing countries we see the, the reverse kind of picture. But um, uh, again, it it's all depends on Ludvika uh, mentioned before. This was getting toward my question, uh, which you sort of covered, but let me ask Ludovica, and then if Jonathan comes back on, I'll ask him. My question is, I mean, I've, you know, I've read enough about the 19th century transportation, which was the horse, to say I'd much rather be breathing in diesel fumes and fumes from automobiles than walking around the streets smelling horse droppings. But as a matter of perception, what do we know about the effects of the old style pollution on mental development as compared to things like fumes, etc., cetera, from uh, carbon based fuels? Ludovica, do we know anything on this at all? Uh, that's a very good question. I think, I mean, I, let me say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think that even when we're thinking about fumes, right, um, right now, 
the again, the more we learn about pollution, the more we learn that we need to tackle it, uh, right? Like, so I think that, yes, we are, you know, compared to industrial pollution at the, you know, at the start of the industrial revolution, we're doing much better now. But we also know that even low levels of pollution, that's true for lead, but that's true for PM 2.5 as well, uh, you know, are still damaging. So even, you know, in areas like Europe, the introduction of low emission zones do improve children's health, do reduce asthma um, incidents and improve children's outcomes. So there's still kind of a lot to be done. With your question with respect to sort of the old style pollution, I don't know that we know much about it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Sethi has some ideas around it. But I think that there, maybe there's something similar because now we're starting to study, for example, the concentrated um, animal farms. Uh, so think yeah. about, you know, these, the big, uh, you know, big farms with lots of, um, hogs, lots of cattle. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, we're actually starting to learn a bit about them and we know that folks that live around them are not happy and they have a reason not to be happy because the, you know, the, the, the smells, uh, they actually can affect people. Uh, and we're starting to learn something about noise pollution as well. It's just, uh, there's, you know, uh, we as humans are are affected by everything that goes around that, that happens around us, um, and we're starting to learn more about it. Fascinating. I'm a labor economist, as you probably know. It's all fine and dandy. It's chemistry. It's wonderful. To me, what counts are employment and wages. Okay, the price and quality, the quantity and price in a labor market. And let me ask first of all, Ludovic, and then go back to Sefi to finish up. We have all these pollution pollutants going on. What's the effect on people's wages, A, and their employment possibilities, and B, are they the same across people, or does this raise or reduce inequality of well-being and outcomes? Ludovica, complicated question, but to me it's the most important question of this. And it is. It is. It is. I think we were starting to learn about uh, long run outcomes. I still I think we've we've kind of like built up. Right. Like we know that uh, pollution affects health uh, in early childhood. It affects the ability of, of children to go to school uh, and absences. It affects the way they learn. We know from work from Sefi that, you know, pollution on the day of your most important exam uh, that gets you into college um, affects how you do. And so it affects the way, you know, your probability of getting into a good school and your, and then it, it affects your, you know, probability of graduating and then uh, your, your labor market, uh, labor market outcomes. Um, what I want to stress is that there's uh, other mechanisms that we're starting to understand that's also non-cognitive. So we're, we're learning that pollution affects your impulsivity your ability to restrain your your probability of fighting against other people get getting into um into into altercations and those we are now learning that those non cognitive skills are super important on the labor market as well right so i think that the, it really really affects people's trajectories and in terms of the inequality question um i think that we 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 tend to see that um the lower uh, ability folks um, are very much affected, but we also see that, um, you know, some of the really high ability folks kind of, you know, end up losing that that edge. Uh, but something that, that I'm starting to look into, which I think is really fast, it's really important to think about this inequality is sort of what happens to the labor market, what happens to people around you as well, right? And so um, what, uh, what, what I'm starting to, to study is that going to school with children who are affected by pollution and therefore are more disruptive as students oh. affects everyone else in the classroom. And so if poor children, minority children, are more likely to live in neighborhoods with high pollution, even if they themselves manage to not get affected by that, then they interact with folks that are and this ends up creating kind of a multiplier effect. That's a very neat point. I hadn't thought of that at all. Sefi, do you want to expand upon this from your own perspective? Yeah, I mean, Ludwig, I already mentioned my paper, so uh, thank you, thank you for doing that. But I think it's, it's kind of it's it's possible to uh, to distinguish between two parts. So first is the preparation to the labor market. So it's what happened in schools, and we have many, you know, we have lots of evidence that. Uh, as, uh, kids that are being uh, uh, exposed to high level of pollution tend to do uh, worse than uh, those that uh, uh, do not. So 
uh, this already kind of affect the preparation and therefore the labor markets uh, um, later on in life. It could be via just, you know, reduction in, in for example, the time they spend in school because they they ill and they have to take uh, time off. That, by the way, can also affect the parents if the parents right. miss, uh, miss days at, at work as well. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, a paper that uh, Ludvika was mentioning that, that, uh, that, that I wrote. Um, uh, we also talk about misallocation of workers uh, across professions because, you know, you, you had a bad day in, in an exam and a very important exam. And instead of going to this profession, you go to another profession because they just don't take you or you go to a certain a university X or a university Y and therefore that uh, affects your future employment. So all of these things are kind of important. The second thing is that there is direct effect of, of, of pollution on, on, on worker productivity. And there are some really famous papers that look at worker productivity in California uh, among uh, per, uh, uh, people that are working in, in factories that are packing fruits. Uh, there are uh, uh, evidence on, on, on coal uh, centers workers in China and even uh, 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 people that work in, 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 on the trade floor uh, in New York City. Uh, all of them are being affected negatively by, by air pollution. So I think that air pollution affects uh, really uh, the, the labor market quite significantly, directly and also uh, indirectly. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really uh, important for us to reduce uh, uh, air pollution, improve air quality for the economy, to improve the economy. This is kind of the main point of control. Let's say miraculously by 2050, all the things that we regard worldwide as pollutants are removed. How long till the world looks unpolluted and the impacts on people have disappeared. Jonathan, are you there? Okay, let me ask each of you quickly, Safi and Ludovica, how long would it take to get back to an unpolluted world if there ever was one? Safi, and then we'll finish with Ludovica, go ahead. So I think we're always gonna have pollution and for the very, very simple, uh, uh, reason is that not all, not all of pollution is man-made. Uh, we we have pollution from natural resources. Think about things like dust storms, uh, volcano eruption, and and forest fire, and all these kind of things. So to to go to a world when we have zero pollution, that's not going to happen. And to be honest, as economists, we don't think that this is what we want, right? What we want is the optimal level of of pollution, right. which is not zero, right? We want to kind of find the right balance between economic activity and environmental protection. Uh, so what, what we really want to make sure is that, first of all, we, we do this calculation when, you know, when we, when we think about policy, we, we actually take into account this externality, what we call economics, the externality, the effect of, of air pollution on the variety of different things that we mentioned today and obviously on, 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 on health directly. Uh, but also what we want to do is to make sure that, uh, we, we come up with, with technological solution that, uh, basically makes the, uh, our ability to reduce pollution uh, relatively easy. So it's basically going to be cheaper for us to, uh, to reduce pollution. Once we do that and we talk about air pollution, once we, we do that and we have this technology, it can be very quick. Pollution doesn't stay, this type of pollution, PM10 or NOx, that doesn't stay, uh, in the atmosphere for long. It dissipates very, very quickly. When we talk about CO2, when we talk about global warming, that's a different story altogether. Okay. Ludovica, do you want to finish up with my stupid question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I, Sefi just, I think, um, you know, mentioned all the, all the important points. I think that the one different, you know, difference maybe is, uh, with respect to some, some of the things I study, which are more, uh, you know, heavy metals, lead, that stuff remains, uh, remains on the ground, um, for, for a long time. And so I think that, um, in that sense, like being able to uh, clean up and to contain some of these um, really, um, you know, toxic pollutants that could infiltrate the infiltrate the aquifer um, that, uh, you know, do not decay. Um, that I think that that's uh, that's potentially, you know, a, just a slightly different story with respect to uh, to air pollution and something that uh, something that we need we need to think about. With that said, you know. Lead was, you know, started being mined, uh, by my, my ancestors, right? Like the Romans, uh, as, as we know. And so it's not something we, we don't necessarily need to go back to, to, to pre, uh, Roman Empire times, uh, in terms of technology, in terms of our, uh, you know, the way that we, we, we utilize resources. But, uh, I think it's worth sort of also, uh, I, I know geologists are doing some really interesting work, sort of trying to, to figure out over time, you know, how, 
um, pollution evolved uh, and sort of, I think, using then like our economists' techniques to figure out what are the what is the optimal levels, what are the trade offs, um, and then uh, and then make uh, make good policy uh, based on that. Let me finish with Jonathan Comer, who is back now. And sorry, technology had a problem. Technology has problems. Let me ask you to do something economists love to do. Predict. My grandchildren will be old people 50 years from now. Do you think they'll live in Western society in a less polluted and because of that healthier world? Or will things get even worse? And don't, don't give me it depends, the typical economist nonsense. Yeah, no, I mean, so no. I think certainly unambiguously pollutants like PM10, PM2.5, ozone, they are they are falling and have fallen substantially over the last four decades and will continue to fall going forward. So, I mean, we talk about 90 percent declines, but the trend for climate change is obviously the complete opposite. Right. We've got increasing emissions still. We still haven't reached peak emissions. And so it, it's going to balance out. I don't know. Like it's uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, there's uncertainty, but the downside risk is immense. Right. I mean, I think just to, to finish, like from an economics perspective, fundamentally, like how does environmental quality matter? It, it distorts and it affects endowments, right? We know that temperature and pollution affects decision-making and cognitive importance, uh, cognitive performance, uh, and so reduces productivity. Uh, but it also, we know that early life exposure affects endowments. And so that affects sort of what is possible. And so this has significant implications for economic inequality and opportunity. And it's a conversation for another time, but given the importance that human capital plays in explaining differences in income across and within countries, I'd argue that environmental quality is a fundamental driver of growth and, and productivity. And so uh, we need to get a better understanding of, of how it determines the accumulation of human capital and what we can do with it. That's great. Let me thank you by summarizing everything everybody said today, which is the standard lie at the end of an academic paper. More research is clearly needed. And these people are all meeting today for the second day of an IGA conference on environment and health. Let me thank all three of you, Safi, Ludovica, Jonathan, for being with me this week. Good luck with your conference. Take care. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.